it's Scott Owen of Cruise Consulting, and today we're talking about how do venture capitalists get their deals approved inside their own partnership. And I'm excited to talk about this because this is kind of behind the curtain stuff here. And uh, I've seen this a lot. I worked in a venture capital partnership and experienced every level of this. So <laughs> I know what I'm talking about on this one. So I'm going to break it up into kind of the three different um, groups inside of a partnership and because they all have kind of different paths to getting their deals approved. First, the managing partners. These are the people who run the show. Before I worked at a, at a venture capital firm, I actually didn't know that there was like different authority levels uh, uh, amongst the partnership. You often, you just think partnership, you think equal partners, but really there are a couple partners or one partner who typically is the person who owns the operating company um, and also is usually responsible, like the founder of the, of the VC fund, very similar to like the founder of a startup and who also is usually one of the best deal people and best fundraising people. And so the way I kind of say it is like they run the show, like they make the rules, they are the boss. And again, I didn't really understand this until I joined a venture capital partnership and saw it all work. Now, these people, kind of practically speaking, they can do the deals they want. Like no one's gonna block them or veto their deals. And practically speaking, if you were to try to kind of veto the deal of a managing partner, you might not be working at that fund very long, right? So there's a certain amount of like self-preservation, job preservation uh, that goes into this. But the best managing partners that I've seen work always run the same process internally, whether it's their deal or someone else's deal. And there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, a, a company, a fund, a group is only as strong as their processes, right? And so you always want to be consistent. You don't want to vary from that. And you want to fine tune those processes to always make the best decisions. This is all about decision making here. Secondly, running the process, facilitating discussions, letting especially the junior people ask questions and see how that managing partner actually gets to make decisions and how they like they get there is actually a great learning tool because oftentimes the managing partner has been around for a long time they're working off of sometimes pattern recognition or relationships um, that go back 20 30 years that maybe the junior people in the partnership actually don't know understand or appreciate and so by asking those questions and having the conversation, writing a thorough memo, all that stuff, um, it really is actually an education tool. And remember, like the managing partner, they're the, they're the bosses. They're employing the junior people because they help them make money and have a better fund and make better decisions and do a lot of research. And so it's very important to develop those junior people. Oftentimes, like associates or principals have like this in the community have this like bad reputation as like people who dial for dollars or have no power in a partnership or things like that, which is that that stuff is kind of true, but they are the future. And there's a reason why they're on the payroll and working at that fund. And so the best managing partners I've seen are the ones who kind of teach through example, teach through the deal flow, teach through decision making. It's actually really, really effective and builds a stronger fund down the road. Now we're gonna talk about kind of the non-managing partners, but senior partners. These are people who've been in the fund for a long time. And yes, maybe they don't own the operating company, uh, but they're highly valued team members at the fund and probably part of the executive committee. And, you know, again, they are there for a reason. If you think about it, they're taking up an important spot they probably have a lot of carry in the fund. They make a big salary. And so, you know, they are there for a reason. They're not just like window dressing or things like that. And depending on their credibility and past success or excitement in them joining the firm, they get different levels of um, uh, uh, scrutiny in their, in their approval process. So say it's someone who's been there for 10 or 15 years, total superstar, could easily start their own fund, that kind of thing. Well, that person's gonna get treated kind of like how the managing partner gets treated. Like, yes, there's gonna be some, uh, a lot of discussion and fact finding and things like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, if it's a, if, 
if that person wants it and they can convince the rest of the team, it's going to happen. Now, say you're newly uh, promoted to like partner or something like that. I don't have as much credibility as that person's been there for 20 years. Well, you're going to be kind of skewing towards more of the junior side, right? A lot more work, a lot more questions you may need, you know, someone to go to bat for you, that kind of stuff. So it depends on who this person is in the partnership how much credibility they have, how much money they've made for the partnership or are going to make, you know, there's a lot of folks who are in the situation who have a wonderful portfolio of markups on their venture capital investments, not a lot of liquidity yet, but like, it's pretty clear they're good decision makers and good at finding the best companies and will, it's pretty obvious to the partnership that those deals are going to make money in the future. So they're going to get a long leash, so to speak. So that brings us to the third criteria which is, I would say, junior people, junior partners, and new deal makers. And this is a group where, you know, they, again, they can really originate some amazing opportunities, ideas. They do a lot of the legwork. They work very hard. Uh, but when they're getting their deals approved or sponsoring deals, oftentimes they have, it's a little bit of a different rule. So the first one is oftentimes, especially junior people, they will need to partner with a more senior member of the team to kind of like co-sign or co-underwrite that deal. It just makes sense, right? You don't, you want someone with a lot of experience to look at something and sponsor inside the partnership. And frankly, when you are talking to the founders, a smart founder is going to be talking to a more junior person and realize they need senior sponsorship to get the deal done. So a smart founder is not going to sign a term sheet if they've only interacted with someone on a junior level because they have to worry whether that's actually going to get through the partnership or not, right? So there, there's practical reasons for senior sponsorship on both sides, both the origination side and on the approval side. Now, sometimes you hear horror stories of a senior person kind of swooping in and uh, taking a junior person's deal, right? And that does happen, but I think it's a little bit more two things. It doesn't happen like that in well-functioning partnerships. It's not a, it's not so much a credit game or who did what kind of thing. It's a team sport. Um, and secondly, like, again, practically speaking, like there's a senior person needed to probably underwrite something or get, get behind a deal for it to truly get through. So th this is like kind of the nightmare scenario for a junior person. I remember, when I was a junior person wondering about this kind of stuff, I was very fortunate uh, in my career. We ha I just worked with some really great people who were always very kind and generous to me and gave me a lot of great feedback and helped support the deals I wanted to do. And I will always be grateful for that. Um, so it's not something I really experienced ever personally, but you do hear about it once, once in a while. Again, uh, in a well-functioning partnership, people kind of know who sourced what and who originated what and who got someone to sign on dotted line. So I think this is a little bit, this is more almost like, um, uh, like, a an urban legend nightmare kind of thing than something that happens all the time. Usually the, the roles are pretty well understood. Um, another thing, if you're a junior person, the smaller deals are easier to get done. So they, that's actually why you see a lot of people new to venture capital or, the younger side getting in at the seed stage or pre-seed stage uh, in those funds because really a you're not going against the heavyweights of the, of the industry too often you do go against them sometimes um, but you have a little bit more um, leniency you can make an impression easier you can pick up a hot sector earlier easier that kind of stuff and frankly if it's a loss or a bad deal you know losing a million or two million dollars is not going to kill a partnership or kill a fund losing $50 million. It probably won't kill a fund, but it can hurt. Right. And so the, the kind of responsibility threshold tends to, it's like human nature just goes down as the dollar amounts are lower. Um, I mean, I remember back in my career, like I was able to put money in zipline when I was a young person out of fund when, because zipline was like, it wasn't even called zipline. It was a tiny, tiny company. We did $250,000 investment. And no one really paid that much attention to it or cared that much, right? People are scrutinized, but it wasn't crazy. 
and I, I worked on Impossible Foods, same thing, right? Like uh, non-meat meat, that sounds crazy. Who would ever invest in that? Well, we invest in that because I thought it was a good idea and it was a small dollar amount. And so I was able to get through the partnership despite being a young person in the partnership. So that that's kind of like, those are some practical examples, right? Um, little dollar amounts, easier to get through. The founders know they're not betting the company on you so they can take your money. Um, and they know the partnership behind it, right? Um, if you're a junior person or fairly new, you should also be aware that you only have a few shots on goal. Like you don't get to just make venture capital investments in perpetuity if you're making bad investments. Generally speaking, it's like four or five investments. A, a, a typical venture capital person will do one to two deals, maybe, maybe in a super hot year, three deals in a year, right? That they'll be sponsored or be on the board of. Three's a lot. Um, and so you only get a couple years to, to prove yourself and for the rest of the partnership to judge how you're doing. So make them count. Don't just spray and pray. Be careful, be smart, um, and make those deals count. We talked about uh, pattern recognition for the managing directors earlier. Beware if you're a younger or new person for negative pattern recognition. Pretty much every idea that comes across a venture capital fund has been tried at least once before, always 10 years before, and oftentimes uh, someone in that partnership lost money making that investment. So, hey, we tried this 10 years ago and it didn't work. You hear that all the time. And so you have to be aware that that uh, negative could be brought up while you're trying to get your deal through partnership in the discussion and be ready for that. Why is it different this time? Why are the entrepreneurs different? Why is the market more mature? Why is the market ready for this? Why is the technology different? Those are all key questions. Be ready for the, we tried this 10 years ago and it didn't work, uh, negative. Um, the other thing a junior partner or junior person can do is take on other roles at the partnership uh, or the fund to show that you care. You know, there's a variety of this. Like, the example for me was I became chief compliance officer when we started getting regulated all of a sudden. And it wasn't because I wanted to do that. It was because we were a team and I was uniquely qualified to do that in a way. And I was also someone who was willing to do the work, the extra work, right? It wasn't like I got more money for doing that or anything like that. I did it for the benefit of the partnership, benefit of the fund, and people noticed that and appreciate that. And so that buys you goodwill um, in the deal process, right? So there, for, for better or worse, there's, it's a political process sometimes and having, um, the benefit of the doubt because you put extra work in or took on some extra responsibility is actually really helpful. So those are the three buckets of people at a partnership and who have different levels of autonomy, authority, ability to do an investment. And whether you're the managing director, the senior person who maybe isn't a managing director, but very senior, very credible, or you're the junior person. Remember, everyone started as a junior person. Everyone had to learn. It's a, a business that you learn through experience. And as you work your way up, be kind to the junior people, appreciate the senior people. And when you're running your own fund, make sure you run a nice tight process and always do it the same way so that you can teach the rest of the team how to actually evaluate opportunity. Hope that helps. Hit us up at cruiseconsulting.com if you have any questions. Thanks so much.